Very good evening to all. I'm Dr. Vishnu Mohan, Secretary of NNF Kerala and Organizing Secretary of IEP NeoCon 2020. On behalf of IEP NeoChap and the organizing team, I extend a warm welcome to you all to the ninth webinar of Learn from the Legend series. First, let me welcome our distinguished speaker for the day, one of the real legends in our field of neonatology, Professor Dr. Rangasamy Ramanathan from Los Angeles, USA. Welcome you, sir, to the program. To moderate the session, I welcome Dr. Karthik Nagesh from Bangalore, one of the senior most neonatologists in our country, and Dr. Uma Maheshwari, Associate Professor of Neonatology at Sri Ramachandra Medical College, Chennai. And a very warm welcome to all our dear, dear delegates who have logged in from different parts of the world to today's session of Learn from the Legends. I request the moderators to take over for further proceedings. Hello, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vishnu Mohan, for the warm welcome. I extend my warm welcome to all the learned neonatal delegates from across the different parts of the country and across overseas venues as well. <laughs> At the outset, I must uh, congratulate and also thank heartfully the organizers of this wonderful series of Learn from the Legions, which is organized by the NNF Kerala branch and the IAP Neocon chapter which has really enabled most of us to learn directly from the legends themselves and interact with the legends themselves in our field. Thank you so much, Dr. Manoj, Dr. Vishnu Mohan, Dr. Verma, for this privilege given to me to introduce this exciting session uh, subject, which is after my heart, which is the use of surfactant in newborns. Some of us uh, senior neonatologists, as Vishnu said, have had the opportunity to do neonatal care for babies about close to two to four decades in this country. And we have seen the growth of neonatology in this country from its uh, very, very infant beginnings to what it is now. We are almost akin to whatever is the wonderful care being given elsewhere in the world. Apart from ventilation, which has probably been the most uh, important aspect which helped save so many babies across the world. I think it is a fact in therapy which was introduced in the late 80s and it has been available even in this country, initially partly in the early 90s and then late 90s we were able to use a lot of surfactant in this country to save babies and I think it has done a lot of wonder for babies helping them survive better. But as we saw the introduction of more and more research, especially paradigms of research which suggested that non-invasive ventilation is better to do, avoid lung injury to babies, and therefore with the advent of antenatal steroids, early delivery room CPAP, even prophylactic CPAP, we have realized that the advantages are in trying to give non-invasive ventilation and you're able to get babies better, especially the smaller ones seem to do better with less of chronic lung disease. So with this, the mid 2000s or even till the late 2000s saw the decrease in surfactant, but nevertheless, we did feel that in about some babies who were not able to really do well, especially the small ones who were less than 28 weeks gestation, we had realized that we need to still give them some surfactant. So a lot of research, the paradigms of which were initiated by people like Professor Ramnathan today's legend speaker suggested that we can probably intubate partially for some short while the small premature babies, give them surfactant, try to extubate them, and then see what they do. And that was a great paradigm shift in the way we were giving surfactant. But then what is exciting now is that even lesser invasive modes of surfactant delivery and administration can help these babies as we are now seeing. And this is where a lot of new research has shown the advantages of less invasive surfactant administration and even without invasion or to the trying to give surfactant with a nebulized form or maybe pharyngeal installation. These are some of the things which are very exciting researches which are going to be talking, talked about by the legend himself, Professor Ramanathan, who has been such a close personal friend for more than two decades now. He is a master. He is a master of respiratory care for newborns. He's done the original work on surfactant, especially coractant. And now recently he has done the original work on synthetic surfactants. And more than being a legend and a clinically excellent person, 
and his credentials speak for themselves. He's a very, very humble gentleman. He's a very approachable person. He has been almost like my mentor for these last two decades. And I reached out to him for any problems which have been afflicting us in this country for looking after newborns. So without much ado, I'm going to ask my colleague who's an accomplished neonatologist. She is a colleague moderator of mine, Dr. Uma Maheshwari. She is herself an associate professor of neonatology at the well-known Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Hospitals in Chennai. She's going to be probably uh, doing the honors and introducing Professor Rangaswamy Ramanathan, and then we can have a session. Roma, over to you, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is not only my great privilege and pressure uh, to introduce Professor Rangaswamy Ramanathan, the world-renowned neonatologist affiliated to multiple hospitals in Los Angeles, including Children's Hospital Los Angeles, uh, LAC, and USC MC. We take great pride in saying this. He did his medical schooling in Stanley Medical College in Chennai and his post-graduation from Institute of Child Health. He has created a magic kingdom in Los Angeles, which he describes in a short video in YouTube. During his short stay as an observer in Georgetown, Washington Hospital in uh, Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, um, like I happened to see the widespread use of RAM cannula. So I was wondering what is this RAM? Um, it is something like a computer thing. Then I, I came to know that it is not RAM cannula, it is RAM cannula named after the inventor, Professor Rangasami Ramnathan. My feet was not staying in the ground. So we are very proud of you, sir. It has been widely used all over the world, even in underdeveloped countries like Uganda. Um, he has bagged a multiple awards um, and to say a few Lifetime Achievement Award, Super Dogs, Top Dogs, Best Teacher Award, Hero of Medical Center Award. He has been the PA for many funded projects and has published his research work in many international distinguished journals. His uh, recent publications on third generation synthetic surfactant, as mentioned by Professor Karthik Nagesh, is, uh, is mentioning noteworthy. Uh, it's, uh, we have to mention that it is on the third generation synthetic surfactant on CHF 5633 compared to Poractin's uh, alpha, a multicentric double blinded RCT, where he showed similar efficacy and safety. This might open up a new window taking up to the next era of synthetic surfactant. I could go on and on. This evening is not enough. Before I hand over the session, I would like to make a gentle reminder to all the participants to post their questions in the QA, Q and A box, not in the chat box, with their name and the place where they belong to. The truth about the uh, last word, the truth about the life of a man is not what he does, but the legend which he creates around himself. We welcome the true legend, Professor Rangasamy Ramnathan, to deliver the lecture on surfactant therapy, Insure versus CISA. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are, which part of the world. I am really thankful to Manoj and the organizing committee for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here to talk about a topic um, I've been working and I love. Uh, two things only I know how not to intubate a baby, or I try to know or teach and uh, about surfactant. So today, um, I hope you can see my slides. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, how do we give surfactant, uh, Insure or Lisa or Inrexure. And then there is also um, different terminologies that are used, sure or even sad. I don't know who came up with a SAD mnemonic. It stands for supraglottic airway device. Uh, conflict of interest disclosures, being a CME, um, I'm a consultant or a speaker's bureau or receive research grant support from many organizations, uh, companies that make surfactant or devices like Burroughs Welcome, KCUSA, Abbey, Mead Johnson, Icaria, Carfusion, Mallinckrodt, and Neotic products. If I receive any honorarium, I donate to a charity that helps mothers, newborns, and children globally. I have no equities and do not receive any royalty payments from any surfactant manufacturers. 
So we've come a long way. In the 1980s, you know, most babies were intubated. And then we decided whether it should give surfactant or not, whether prophylactic or rescue surfactant therapy. Then Professor um, uh, Hendrik Werder, uh, he's actually traveling on a train somewhere in Europe today. So he said he'll try to uh, join us. Uh, introduced the term insure, intubation, surfactant, and extubation. That was first reported in Scandinavia. Actually, the very first study was done in Kuwait. And I'll show you that when I talk about insure. Uh, and then recently, a paper from the uh, Netherlands about uh, intubation, recruitment of the lung, giving surfactant, and extubating the baby. Then Lisa um, became very popular in the European countries, uh, Cologne, um, Angela um, uh, predominantly started using this, and then in Vienna and other places. MIST, minimally invasive surfactant treatment, uh, was coined uh, by Peter Dorgeville, and then using uh, laryngeal mask airway or just dropping the surfactant into pharyngeal installation. All of them have been tried, and then finally, nebulization or atomization or some other things that we are looking at. Truly non invasive surfactant administration or treatment called MIST. So we are from MIST soon, we may go to NIST in the next couple of few years. It's a very interesting and a lot of very good preclinical data on you can deliver enough surfactant to improve lung compliance, blood gases, and I'll show you at the end. So what is insure? Um, most of you know here is intubation, surfactant, extubation. Professor Hendrik Werder from Denmark introduced coined this term many years ago. It typically involves surfactant administration using an endotracheal tube or a feeding tube and providing positive pressure breaths, often with pre-medication of sedation. Patient is disconnected from CPAP during surfactant administration and given breaths for two to five minutes in the next debate. The major problem is that once you give insure with an endotracheal tube, <clears throat> many of us, even today, do not extubate these babies. We leave them intubated. Also, when you are giving this positive pressure breath, you really don't have any control on the tidal volume. As you know, four or even five breaths of large tidal volumes can cause injury to the lung. The first report on insure, which um, happened in 14 patients, all of them are greater than 1500 grams uh, with RDS in Kuwait, with no mechanical ventilation and no CPAP. There were no positive pressure breaths at all given, uh, no way of giving it. So they said, let's go and give surfactant, 200 milligram per kilo. They gave a bovine surfactant for hyaline membrane disease. It was then called. Uh, Victorian from Sweden, when uh, working in uh, Kuwait, and I was interested to even to see the second author of this paper is Deva Rajan. Um, so they, and with uh, Tori Kustet and uh, Bank Robertson's group, they gave this surfactant and they showed improvement in survival and, and gas exchange. Um, this is uh, just surfactant and nothing else, no CPAP, no ventilation. So a couple of years later, Professor Hendrik Werder um, introduced the concept of insure, post surfactant, keeping the babies on CPAP. Um, so why insure? Why? Why do you want to think about giving surfactant to babies? If the baby has RDS and CPAP fails, this is what happens. Serious morbidity happens. This uh, an observational study by Peter Dorgeville. He showed that this is the gray bars are um, CPAP failures, pneumothorax, death, BPD, death or BPD as a composite outcome, or any one of these major morbidities are extremely high if the babies fail CPAP without surfactant. And, and this is in 25 to 28 week gestation. Similarly, even in bigger babies, 29 to 32 week gestation, if you don't give surfactant to a baby, pneumothorax incidence is significantly higher and uh, other differences were not statistically significant. So both in small babies and big babies, moderately big preterm babies, um, surfactant treatment improves the outcome. What are the reasons for insured failure? Uh, if the baby is less than 750 grams in one study, 
and in another study, even babies extremely low birth weight, just like less than one kilo. Also, the failure rates with insure is higher. Uh, you can predict uh, insure failures by looking at some of these criteria in different studies. PF ratio, less than 218, and AA ratio, arterial to alveolar PO2, less than 0 0.44, or PCO2 greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. And in one study, arterial to alveolar PO2 less than 0.18. These are extremely sick babies. Normal AA ratio in a preterm baby is about 0.7 or 0.8. You can see how hypoxemic these babies are. Uh, or some have used radiological criteria, grading criteria. So infants who fail insure are obviously often intubated and then continue to be mechanically ventilated. So what happens with multiple insure procedures? Infants who require multiple insure procedures have significantly lower gestational age, lower birth weight, and had more severe RDS at the beginning, and also had a higher incidence of PDA, longer duration of oxygen therapy compared to babies who responded to single insure group. It's, it's clear, right? Younger gestational age, more severe RDS, even the insure failure rate is higher. And uh, you can see need for mechanical ventilation is significantly increased from 15 to 23%. And there was no uh, change in PPD in babies who are treated with a single dose or multiple doses of surfactant using insure technique. So how can we minimize um, insure failures? Um, most of the studies were done using insure. And then after that, babies were maintained on nasal CPAP. And nasal CPAP with or without insure failure rates in different randomized control trials range from 24 to 67%. So what about insure and maintain the babies on nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation or NIPPV? Uh, here is our study we published in 2012. So babies were given early insure with 200 milligram per kilo of poractant alpha and then looked at the outcomes and the extubation failures. So babies are randomized to either nasal CPAP, post-insure, or NIPPV in babies less than 30 weeks gestation. You can see that mechanical ventilation via the endotracheal tube at seven days of age was 17% versus 42%. Uh, total extubation failures needing intubation was 23% throughout the NICU stay compared to 58%. We also showed physiological BPD was lower Oxygen at 36 weeks also significantly lower if the babies were given <coughs> surfactant and then maintained on NIPPV, you reduce the need for intubation and reintubations, and therefore you protect the lung and reduce the risk for BPD. Again, BPD is a secondary outcome, not a primary outcome. And there was no difference in the need for additional doses, even though 21%, 4 uh, percent of the babies, more babies got surfactant but that was not statistically significant. So what is LISA? It is known by different names, LISA, LIST, MIST. Uh, I'll show you 12 different ways it has been known. Um, the technique involves surfactant administration in this small tube, other than an endotracheal tube, while the baby is breathing spontaneously on nasal CPAP or on NIPPV support, typically without any pre-medication or sedation. Again, when I say typically, there are no standardized way of giving either insure or LISA. Depends on where, in which country you are practicing. Um, some have called us missed minimally invasive surfactant treatment, less invasive surfactant administration, avoidance of mechanical ventilation, surfactant without intubation. It's a German group, but I think it's a misnomer. When you put something through the Local cards to me, that's intubation. This is the meant surfactant without an endotracheal intubation using an endotracheal tube. Take care approach, Turkish people call that. Non intubated surfactant application, again, a study from Germany. Sonsure, Sonda nasogastrica surfactant de extubation from Spain. Saint, I even forgot what the Saint stands for. Ecalmist, early CPAP and large volume mist. MISER, minimally invasive surfactant administration, LIST, or less invasive surfactant treatment, and SURE, uh, just recently from 
India, um, the group uh, published a paper, they called it as sure. Um, so factored without endotracheal tube intubation. So all of them pretty much mean the same. You are not using an endotracheal tube. You have the baby who's breathing spontaneously and typically giving it with a smaller tube, a feeding tube, umbilical arterial catheter or different tubes I will show you in a minute, uh, typically without pre-medication or sedation. But that practice may be changing uh, as we get more experience using LISA technique. So what are the major differences, similarities and depth between the two? So in need for direct laryngoscopy, both insure and LISA techniques do need uh, both of them, right? So trying to get this out of my way. Um, need for positive pressure ventilation in insure because you're using an endotracheal tube and you give surfactant, it has to be given either with bag or on a ventilator, positive pressure breaths. With a skier, surfactant dis uh, distribution relies on spontaneous breathing. And that is why you don't want to decrease the baby's spontaneous respiratory effort with heavy sedation. Uh, endotracheal tube, here thin catheters, feeding tube, angiocatheter, arterial catheter, or LISA catheter. Secure airway, yes, since you intubate the baby, you have a very good idea where your tube is. <coughs> Whereas with the LISA technique, you have to be very careful, make sure the tube, the catheter or the tube feeding tube are using stays in the trachea. Vocal cord position remains abducted. Vocal cords can adduct in LISA. Sedative medications are often used because we're intubating the baby. Here, less often used, so called awake intubation. So that's where some people have problems with it. Can we <coughs> intubate the baby electively for surfactant administration without sedation or pre-medication? Well, I'll discuss about that. Tolerability, babies over 30 weeks tolerate very well. Extremely low gestation like neonates like micropremies tolerate uh, LISA procedure much better. Surfactant kinetics, a uh, study was done by Kaiser Bolin uh, from Stockholm, published many years ago. She looked at uh, lung association in an animal model um, during insure and compared with LISA. This lung association of surfactant is less and she measured dynamic compliance was also low. Whereas with LISA technique, she showed better distribution of surfactant in the lung as well as improved dynamic compliance. Here is the study. Uh, looking at, this is spontaneous breathing. This is mechanical ventilation. This is looking at the radioactivity of labeled surfactant in uh, preterm rabbits. And she showed that uh, uh, distribution of surfactant is much better compared to insure technique. This is time zero control animals. And she also looked at compliance. You can see in a spontaneous breathing with the LISA technique, compliance was much improved compared to insure technique. So in all these patient groups, animals, kilos of 200 milligram was given with pharyngeal installation and then allowed to spontaneous breathing that equivalent of LISA and then mechanically ventilated equivalent of insure. So they concluded that positive pressure ventilation post surfactant treatment impairs tissue association of exogenous surfactant and lower dynamic compliance and also she demonstrated inactivation of the surfactant. Once you start injuring the lung, your surfactant gets inactivated, whether it's exogenous or endogenous surfactant that the babies make. So there are a number of tubes that are used, a nasogastric tube with a side end, end hole, or just end hole, uh, suction catheter, uh, umbilical arterial catheters, 16 gauge angio catheter, and LISA cat, which I'm going to discuss at the end. Um, we are planning a study, a multicentral study in the United States. So 1.7 millimeter outer diameter, and then the classical endotracheal tube. Uh, I took this from uh, Max Vento from Spain's uh, review article or consensus statement published last year. So we reviewed uh, years ago, many about in 2017, we published a review article looking at techniques um, uh, people are using, so-called the Cologne method. They use four or five French feeding tube and the dose of surfactant, pre-medication, all of them are different in different studies. You can see in Cologne, they used atropine, sedation, analgesia as an option. 
um, even over one to three minutes. Uh, again, another German study for French feeding tube, given over one to five minutes. Atropine was optional. Hobart method from Australasia by Peter Dorgeville, 16 gauge angio cap, 100 to 200 milligram per kilo, much faster, even over 15 to 30 seconds. And sucrose was, uh, was their uh, pre medicational analgesia. Uh, again, NINSAP trial, catheter using Megal forceps, and so factoring is given one to three minutes. Again, atropine sedation analgesics were optional. LISA method in Austria, 1.3 millimeter diameter feeding tube using a Megal forceps, 200 milligram per kilo, given over two to five minutes. No pre medication, no sedation, no atropine. Turkish group published their paper with five French feeding tube, 30 to 60 seconds, no sedation. In Spain, they used four French feeding tube, again, timing one to three minutes, atropine. Karolinska method, five French, cut to 30 centimeters, and atropine and fentanyl were used. E Calvin study, 17 gauge vascular catheter, 130 millimeters long, and the dose of surfactant is 5 ml per kilo, um, 0.5 ml bolus over 20 to 30 seconds, and then keep repeating it. Same trial, 300 millimeter long catheter, not specified in narcotic analgesia. Nisa trial, feeding tube, 4 ml, not specified. As you can see, the type of TB used for catheter use is different. The dose of surfactant use is different. And I want you to remember that it is, there are important things um, when we talk about dose. And the timing, how fast you give it is also different. Pre-medication, yes, no. So again, it's not uh, yet standardized. Let's look at the data. So there are six randomized controls that have been published. Um, uh, uh, all of them are using uh, HeroServe. Uh, 895 patients in the systematic review and meta-analysis by Rigo et al. from Belgium. So they, this is LISA or LIST, this is INSHO, and all of them are mostly on CPAP. Uh, so they looked at BPD among all patients, BPD in survivors, death or BPD as a composite outcome, or early CPAP failure, or any mechanical ventilation reported. All of them are in favor of LISA or LIST. The morbidities, no difference. No difference in PDA, no difference in PDA ligation, ROP, PBL, severe intraventricular hemorrhage or any IVH, necrotizing enterocolitis, death or morbidity. None of them are different between these two, except death or BPD as a composite outcome was less in favor of LISA or LIST technique. Coughing and reflux, surfactant so reflux was a major issue in LISA. So you have to be very careful, especially if you're using a larger volume surfactant, you need to slow down to minimize reflux and reflux-induced bradycardia and desaturations. The second, using the same studies, six studies, the second meta-analysis was published by Adana, uh, Aldana Ayer from Alberta, Canada uh, in 2017. Again, from Germany, Gopal et al., Canmas from Turkey, Mimia from Iran, Mohammed in Iran, Bao from China, and Angela Cripps from Germany. Um, so you can see the technique. Uh, they all called it as LISA, except um, China. They called it as MIST. And control group was CPAP. Control group was insured in the rest of the trials. Gestational age range from 26 to 34 weeks. Uh, LISA versus control. Uh, these are about 100 babies in each arm. 60 to 70 babies, a small study here, 47, 43, about 100. So totally 685. Age of randomization, typically less than two hours in most of the studies, except the early study by Gopal et al, less than 12 hours of age. Criteria for CPAP and FiO2, most of them use 0 0.3 as the criteria. Again, I want you to remember the, what FiO2 should we even think about giving surfactant is also changing. In 2013, they used to, in Turkey, they used 0 0.4 as a criteria to give surfactant. Again, uh, dosing 100, 100, and then 200 or 200 in these two studies, 100, it's anywhere from 100 to 200, depending on the weight of the baby, in the 2015 study. Um, the 12 week, it's a multi center study, single center, multi center, multi center, and the multi center trial. Pre medication, again, as you can see, yes, no, no. 
atropine only, uh, not mentioned, atropine only, yes, no. So in, they show LISA compared to INSURE, decrease the need for positive pressure ventilation, reduction in death or BPD or BPD alone, very similar to Rigo's systematic review and analysis findings. You can see the odds ratio, effective, um, relative risk, uh, death or BPD at 36 weeks, 0 0.75, BPD at 36 weeks among survivors, also 0 0.72 relative risk. All of them are statistically significant. Number of babies on mechanical ventilation by 72 hours of age was also significantly lower, as well as mechanical ventilation anytime in favor of LISA compared to INSURE, and no other complications. The only thing, as I mentioned, surfactant reflux was much more common with LISA 2.52. Pulmonary hemorrhage, no difference. So what happens in with LISA? Does the surfactant get distributed? So here is a very nice study, but a small study published um, in 2016 uh, from Amsterdam. They looked at end expiratory lung volume and SF ratio, saturation to FiO2 ratio in 26 to 36 gestation babies on nasal CPAP and the FiO2 was greater than 0.30. It's a prospective observation study. So they used uh, using an umbilical catheter, Kirosur, 160 to 240 milligram per kilo, given over one to three minutes. Interestingly, they had it under direct visualization of the ocal cards. So babies, when they were getting surfactant, was not getting positive pressure. Because if you keep the mouth open with the laryngoscope, you lose a lot of the CPAP pressure. So in spite of that, uh, using electrical impedance tomography, they looked at end expiratory lung volume. This is baseline. This is um, end expiratory lung volume at one minute, five minutes, 30 minutes, and 60 minutes. So after within five minutes, you can see a significant increase in end expiratory lung volume. So even with loss of pressure, they keep in the mouth open, you are able to improve the lung volume. That means you are able to deliver uh, surfactant into the lung. And also we can see improvement in SF ratio significantly. And this is before, this is end of surfactant treatment. And then here is done within time. One minute, five minutes, 30 or 60 minutes. You can see a statistically significant improvement in oxygenation as well as improvement in FRC, lung volume. So um, here is uh, another study, very similar to what we did in 2012. Here, they gave LISA um, and then followed by uh, then randomized the babies to CPAP or NIPPV in preterm infants, 26 to 30 gestation. It's a large study, 200 babies in this randomized control trial. And they give 200 milligrams per kilo of foractant alpha and mechanical ventilation by 72 hours was 13%. Almost similar to what we published. And then overall need for mechanical ventilation was also less. Interestingly, they showed surfactant reflux was also less. And remember that. During NIPPV, even in adult patients with, uh, who are getting bronchoscopy, you can actually decrease bradycardia and desaturations and deliver more pressure in adult patients uh, with NIPPV compared to nasal CPAP. So clearly, during NIPPV, you do deliver more pressure, even though there is a catheter or an at least a cat, uh, angiocatheter in the trachea, the diameter is so small. Some are concerned that you may not be able to deliver the pressure, especially in small preemies where the ET tube, um, uh, the tracheal diameter may be 2.5 to 3 millimeters, right? So, however, you can see surfactant treatment uh, was required only in 38% compared to 60% if they were on CPAP. Moderate to severe RDS was also lower. Number of babies requiring more than uh, one, two, two or more doses was also lower, but not statistically significant. So very similar to what we showed three years ago. Uh, this study was just published uh, from Turkey, Ankal, so by Ankal et al. So what about LISA in moderate and late preterm babies? I know in developed low and middle income countries, they're not going after 23 weeker or a 25 weeker or 24 weeker in some centers. Um, low and middle income countries. So here is a study looking at late preterm babies or moderate preterm, 32 to 36 gestation, 
a multi-center randomized controlled trial from Quebec, Canada. So they looked at, they used MIST. So they used LISA using Viratin or Cervanta, four ml per kilo via five French feeding tube, again, under direct vision in moderately preterm infants was associated with significant reduction in mechanical ventilation. So need for mechanical ventilation or pneumothorax needing a chest tube was 33% compared to 90%. That's pretty high. 90% incidence of pneumothorax or need for mechanical ventilation in babies between 30 to 36 weeks. Is a, I was very surprised at this number. Pneumothorax alone was not different. Number of babies requiring two or more doses was high, 37.5 compared to 24%, but not statistically significant, a small number. And then they gave pre-medication was atropine plus fentanyl. So fat and reflux with the LISA technique or the MIS technique was 66%. They observed reflux of the medication. Very likely two things. One, a large volume of surfactant. Two, they kept the mouth open under direct vision Why? they were pushing the surfactant in. And that's why I told you, it's very important that we should continue to deliver positive pressure during LISA or MIS technique. Otherwise, you will end up losing a lot of surfactant. And you may not be able to deliver much surfactant into the lung. So here is an experience, observation study of um, five-year single center experience in preterm infant between 25 to 29 weeks uh, using LISA, they use a feeding tube, uh, in shoe via endotracheal tube, no pre-medication, again from Ankara, Turkey. And um, birth weight, uh, similar, about one kilo, mean gestational age, 28 weeks. And they showed that mechanical ventilation uh, within seven to two hours of life was significantly lower, 27% versus 42%. This is after they started using LISA routinely in their NICU. Age at the first dose of surfactant was not different, around two hours. So early rescue surfactant therapy. BPD, total incidence was lower, 43% versus 54. And then moderate to severe BPD was also less. Again, it's a secondary outcome, also an observation study. So these are treatment is associated with less need for mechanical ventilation, is associated with less, less moderate to severe BPD. But we already saw six studies that in randomized control trial that showed BPD was significantly less death or BPD. So what do we do? Uh, this is our guidelines in our NICU when we use LISA. We give atropine 20 micrograms per kilo per dose IV four minutes before we start the procedure. And then fentanyl one or two mics per kilo per dose, three minutes, even over three minutes. And we do keep naloxone at the bedside to reverse the effects of fentanyl, like chest wall rigidity or vocal cord spasm. May need to use vecronium if naloxone is not effective to reverse the effect of fentanyl. Again, we don't routinely reverse it with Narcan, only if we see poor respiratory effect. Again, we use NIPPV, and therefore we support the baby, even if the baby has hypopnea, uh, uh, intubation at time zero. Second option is just use atropine and oral sucrose, 24%. Single dose, 0.2 ml for babies less than 32 weeks or 0.4 ml for babies over 32 weeks to term. And oral sucrose effect lasts for five to eight minutes. So you don't have to really rush and complete the procedure or attempt to intubate. Does LISA have any issues, complications? I told you the benefits of LISA compared to insure. I told you about the reflux, but here is a very large German neonatal network data. Uh, they looked at very low birth weight infants. 2,624 babies were treated with LISA. 3,095 babies were given surfactant by endotracheal tube in the years between 2009 to 2016. You can see um, the LISA babies were slightly bigger, 884 compared to 814. Gestational age, 26.8 compared to 26.2. Mortality was low, BPD was lower. IVH, especially grade two to four was significantly lower, nearly half. Out of recurring surgery was also half. So when they looked at the outcomes with using multivariate regression analysis, they showed that mortality odds ratio was 0.66. BPD, IVH, ROP needing surgery, 
However, they found focal intestinal perforation was higher, 49%, 1.49 odds ratio, uh, range 14 to uh, 95, 1.14 to 1.95. And then this was much more, focal intestinal perforation was much more common in babies less than 26 weeks, 10% with LISA, 7.4% with endotracheal tube uh, technique. So I really, they could not explain what would have caused LISA uh, in perforation with the LISA technique more often than with endotracheal tube, especially in micro preemies. So uh, focal intestinal perforation needing surgery as a percentage was much higher in 22 week babies in 23 weeks. And then after 25 and 26 weeks, there's no difference in need for surgery. And then they looked at inotropes and chorionitis, postnatal steroids, PDA drug treatment was more commonly seen in babies who got perforation, uh, multiple gestation, female gender was protective, antenatal steroids didn't have much effect on them. this spontaneous uh, focal intestinal perforation, again, SGA. So they concluded that was seen predominantly in babies under 26 gestation. Not other, none of the other studies to date have reported this complication. <clears throat> so I told you, <clears throat> insure fails. LISA also will fail. So what are the risk factors um, for LISA or MIS to fail? They looked at about 185 babies and they found lower surfactant dosing and no antenatal steroids. These are modifiable factors. We can modify them as clinicians encourage the obstetricians to give more antenatal corticosteroids. And then we, as pediatric and neonatologists, use a larger dose, uh, then you will reduce missed failure. And what happens with missed failures? Missed failures result in severe IVH, decreased survival, and prolonged need for mechanical ventilation. So here is the missed failure group is in the red bar, missed success babies are in the green bar. You can see, if the surfactant dose was less than 200 milligram per kilo, missed failure was 85% compared to 63%. No antenatal corticosteroids, 7.8% of the babies failed to miss compared to nearly 20% of the babies. So by talking to our obstetrics colleagues, encouraging them to give antenatal corticosteroids, we can improve the outcome and we can improve the response of the surfactant in these babies. If infection like CRP was higher, probably congenital pneumonia. So they had more failures with the uh, mist. Oxygen before the mist, higher FiO2. So, so more mist. So if you wait until the FiO2 is more than 0 0.4 or, or 0 0.5, you're going to have more failures with mist or LISA. IBH grade three or grade two or greater than grade two was also higher if the babies failed mist based on mechanical ventilation. So survival, without any of the serious adverse events was 57% if the babies failed, me missed or LISA compared to 76% if the babies you are able to successfully treat the baby with missed or LISA. Again, um, two, it was 14%, uh, 200 milligram per kilo dose compared to 35% if you use less than 200 milligram per kilo per dose. First dose. So there was another study from Netherlands looking at quality assessment and response to LISA without sedation. Should we use sedation? So it's a single center experience, again, experience in preterm infants third, less than 32 weeks. In 48% of the time, LISA, the first attempt failed. In 34%, quality of technical conditions, you know, how they're holding, what the position of the baby's head, how they are trying to intubate were not uh, proper. When the neonatologist performed LISA, the success on the first attempt was 76%. So they concluded that diffuse atropine during LISA resulted in a very low incidence of bradycardia. We know that because babies are extremely vagotonic. Anytime you touch the oropharynx with even a suction catheter, they become bradycardic, right? We all seen that in the delivery room. So giving atropine helps. Uh, they recommend that should therefore be strongly considered whether you use sedatives or not. Success with LISA may be improved with sedative pre-medication, especially in bigger babies who fight, who are attempting to intubate. 
uh, awake intubation, I would recommend sedation. In microcremies, at least give atropine and sucrose uh, if you're concerned about giving. So here is the megal forceps and feeding tube that the Cologne group uses all the time. Uh, for us in the US, um, uh, and even for me, um, it's much easier to use an angiocatheter, LISA catheter than a feeding tube and using a megal forceps. If you are used to nasotracheal intubation, like they do in Canada, for them, this is a piece of cake. But they always intubate nasotracheally, and they use the megal forceps to push the an ET tube into the trachea. For them, it's very easy. But in the United States, over 90% of them, neonatologists, we use orotracheal intubation. So if you are comfortable with nasotracheal, you could use the megal forceps and for your uh, LISA technique. I hope this video plays. This is a video given by uh, Catherine Klepfermas from Vienna, a good friend of mine. And uh, I hope uh, this video shows up well. You can see this baby already has an IV there. You can see some blood there, you know why? They routinely give caffeine before they give Lisa. So secretion, suction, <clears throat> McGill forceps, a feeding tube, if anybody knows Viennese language, you can tell me what she said. <clears throat> so they close the mouth, baby's on CPAP, and then they're pushing the surfactant. You can see, you know, multiple videos on the YouTube or many of the publications about Lisa or Miss Technique. So they're actually aspirating the stomach also to make sure that no surfactant getting into the stomach. Okay, so that's one te one one technique, and then here in uh, in my own unit. Uh, this is one of my fellows um, giving Lisa for the first time. It's a bigger baby, 30 weeks. So we gave atropine and fentanyl. And we used the uh, So I call this off, I guess it's Grand Canyon, dark hole. Don't put anything into the Grand Canyon. So you do need experience. I just want to show you the slide so that we can, when your first time you're doing it, uh, you will be struggling. So if you want to verify, you can use a PD cap to close this thing. Yeah, there it is. So if you want, if you want to verify, oops, oops. if you want to verify the position of the LISA catheter or angio catheter, you can actually put the PD cap. Even you know halfway through, you're concerned about it. Maybe they came out. Just put a PD cap and check it. It's very simple. You don't even have to open the baby's mouth, put in the laryngos again, and see if the, it's going through the vocal cords, which is much more dramatic and invasive than using a PD cap. I was very surprised that the gas the baby is exhaling can come through all the way up 
and picked up by the PDCAP. So Optimus trial, collaborative pair trial of investigating MIST. Uh, Peter Dargaval, um, for many years, he was uh, trying to do the study, uh, 25 to 28 week gestation on CFAP or MIPPV, less than six hours of age, FIO to 0. Point, greater than 0. 0.30. MIST technique was used using the angio catheter. It's a 2.5 endotracheal tube for comparison. Criteria for intubation if the FIO2 was consistently greater than 0.45. Original samples were 606, but it was very difficult to enroll babies. Also, COVID uh, delayed it even more. So the study was stopped um, after the DSMB reviewed the data, and 486 out of the 600, almost 500 babies have been enrolled as of March, and we will know the results pretty soon. So what are they doing in Germany? We started um, in Denmark and Scandinavian countries. First, they started in show, right? Now, looking at the LISA, it's a publication from Professor Herding in last year, looking at uh, LISA use between 2009 to 2017, a significant increase in the use of LISA, which means more babies are also getting surfactant from 2009 to 2017. Endotracheal tube surfactant treatment has come down considerably, and then surfactant, no surfactant use obviously is much lower. Then they looked at a lot of babies, and this is 13,228 babies. A mechanical ventilation, 72 hours. You can see a gestation in 22 weeks, 23 weeks. Still, after Lisa, over 50% of the babies stayed on mechanical ventilation by 72 hours of age. And um, less than 50% once you are at 25, and then at 26, less than 40%. So in bigger babies, you know, 30 weeks, only 10 or 12% of the babies or 15% of the babies are intubated post-LISA in their neonatal network, German neonatal network. They looked at the <coughs> LISA was ensured in BPD. Again, <clears throat> this is no surfactant. This is um, LISA. This is tube surfactant, it ensured. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can see the BPD rates are lower, but uh, not statistically. Uh, sorry goes. to interrupt, sir. The slides are yeah. not moving, sir. Okay. Even now it's not moving? No, sir. It is staying in that optimist. Yes, sir. Oh. Now it's moving. It is moving, sir. Okay. Sorry. Okay. You can see the slide now? Yes, sir. Thank you. So I guess I was an optimist. Um, okay, so this is a German neonate network data that was published last year by Professor Herting, uh, 13,000. You can see the LISA use is uh, going up from 2009 to 2017. And the ET tubes are packed, but the insure technique has come down. The number of babies not getting any surfactant is obviously lower. Uh, need for mechanical ventilation by 70 hours of life in 4,000 babies that were treated with LISA. You know, if you're a more mature baby, 29 or 30 weeks, about 20% or 15% of it's still intubated within seven hours of life. Again, most of these units use uh, CPAP post LISA. Uh, BPD rates um, tend to be lower. The middle light gray bar is LISA. The dark gray bar is uh, tube surfactant or insure. You can see in all gestational age, it's a trend towards less DPD. Again, this is a database, uh, retrospective look at it. IVH grade three or four is also tend to be lower with LISA compared to endotracheal to or insure technique in all gestation age. So they, uh, this is another report from Spain, uh, just published a few months ago in June, 2020, where they looked at LISA and the, uh, this is Lisa, and this is uh, before Lisa, which is in show. So they looked at need for mechanical ventilation, IVH, and mortality, and they showed that less IVH uh, with um, Lisa, which is the red bar, purple compared to blue, pre-Lisa. Number needed to treat is five babies. You can reduce one IVH, which is a pretty good number. But again, is co co historical control uh, not a randomized control trial. 
So need for mechanical ventilation was also lower um, on day one, day three, as well as day seven, number of babies intubated in the LISA uh, or CPAP group, uh, sorry, with LISA was much lower. So the question comes up, I think I've convinced you that LISA is safe and feasible, works well, both in smaller babies and in bigger babies. The question is, what should be the indication for giving surfactant, whether you're using LISA or insure technique? Three large observation studies have been published um, in the last uh, few years. This is again Peter Dargaville from Australia, Tasmania and Australia. They looked at, this is area under the curve, a value of 0.5 means no predictive power. A value of one means excellent, perfect, right? Nothing is perfect. So they looked at in, in babies between 25 to 28 gestation on 29 to 32 gestation, the highest FiO2 value in the first two hours or highest FiO2 value in the first six hours in bigger babies. And guess what? The cutoff was if the FiO2 is more than 0 0.3 in the first hours of life, is a key predictor of CPAP failure and associated with adverse outcomes in both preterm babies below 28 weeks as well as below 32 weeks with an area of interest of at least 0 0.8 in both groups, very close to one. A second study um, published from Poland uh, looking at what FiO2 should be used of factor, 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. Uh, they showed FiO2 of 0 0.29 in the second hour of life was identified as a key risk factor with an area under the curve 0 0.7 for CPAP failure and was associated with higher mortality and morbidity, the sensitivity of 73, specific to 57. So very similar to what Peter Dargo published. A third study by Kaki et al. from Texas uh, last year um, looking at preterm babies less than 30 weeks. Again, retrospective study showed that FiO to 0 0.3 or greater in the second hour of life and radiograph severity RDS predicted CPAP failure. So I think now the tendency used to use 0 0.3 as a cutoff for the first dose of surfactant. The European consensus guidelines have also changed their recommendations to suggested protocol FiO2 more than 0.3 or 30% oxygen on CPAP of plus six. Used to be plus five, now they recommend plus six centimeters for early rescue surfactant treatment. What about supraglottic and supra, there's a typo there, supraglottic airway device delivery, SAD, of laryngeal mask airway of surfactant administration. Eight studies have been published between 2004 to 2018. Um, one, two, three, four of them are randomized control trials. The other were just case reports. So the most recent one by Carrie Roberts uh, was published. Uh, I'm going to show you the data. Uh, here is uh, the study published in 2018. So supra airway device or LMA versus CPAP. So surfactant was given by a laryngeal mask airway and then the control group of CPAP without any surfactant and 28 to 30 kg gestation. Birth weight, minimum weight has to be 1250 because we didn't have a small enough laryngeal mask airway to put in babies less than one kilo or 800 grams. The FiO2 was 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. Uh, interestingly, the control group that were on CPAP, 64% of them subsequently received surfactant anyway. So overall, treatment failures. So here is the need for intubation overall, 30% versus 4 Remember, these babies did not get any surfactant when this outcome was measured.
Okay. Uh, did I lose you? Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, okay. sir. Uh, your slides okay. have gone now. Um, so we need to reshare okay. the slides. Yeah. So where did I got disconnected? Do you know what slide? Sir, uh, you were... Uh, Sir, once the slide plays, I could be able to tell you. Sir. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yes, sir, this one, sad, sad versus CPAP. Oh, great, okay. The, the voice went off initially after the slides also. Yes, sir, with this slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so mean birth weight is about two kilo, 32 weeks. They gave atropine plus sucrose, one ml to the tip of the tongue. And they showed that LMA, surfactant given through LMA decreased the need for intubation. Odds ratio 0 0.30, number needed to treat four. However, in 18% of the babies, they had more than 50% of the surfactant dose aspirated from the stomach. So even with LMA, it's not a tight seal above the glottis. So you will lose the surfactant. Uh, and they also found better response was seen in babies, subgroup of babies between 0 0.30 to 0 0.35 rather than 0 0.35 to 0 0.4. So what catheter should we use preferably? Angiocatheter or Lisa catheter, so-called the Lisa catheter. So this is a mannequin study, Laura Fabri et al. from Pharma Italy published this paper. Uh, they did a five country mannequin study by neonatologists um, from Austria, Belgium, Poland, Spain, and UK. Overall, neonatologists prefer using Lisa cap than the angio cap on the neonatal mannequin. And the reasons they gave why they preferred included the color, the distal markings, and markings at the lip level, and soft rounded tip, and stiffness, kinkability, and uh, lure. Both of them have lure, so they didn't um, have any difference in them, and potential safety. Neonatologists prefer the Lisa cat than the Angio cat. So, are there any problems with the Lisa, and how can we correct them? Bradycardia or desaturations happen, right? Whenever you try to intubate a baby, so give atropine and fentanyl. In some centers, propofol is used in Europe. Again, it is, there's a potential neurotoxicity with propofol, so I do not recommend propofol for the time being. There's no long-term studies on propofol in a preterm baby and neurodevelopmental outcome. Apnea is another common issue. So caffeine before LISA, some have used ketamine, but ketamine increases the risk for apnea risk. And therefore, uh, caffeine is better. LISA failure on first attempt, sedation will improve the, um, your first attempt on uh, putting a, a LISA catheter. Manage, I, I could something like that happened anyway, thanks. I just paused a few questions. I'll ask those questions and then hand over. Hello. Okay, um, I think the panelists or somebody's talking. Okay, insertion depth, 1.5 centimeters for babies less than 27 weeks, mm -hmm. two centimeters for all others. This is the Melbourne group recommendation. If you're worried about the dislodgement of the catheter, I will I check, check with, or, or check what, with. I cannot create confusion now. You send me the question then, what I should ask. Or uh, the, the, whatever I. Hello? Coughing, um, so check with the EC cap or CO2 deductor or PD cap. Coughing or gagging, you have to slow down the administration. You could give it over two or three minutes. Reflux, use a small caliber catheter like Lisa cat or an angio catheter. You can also use a small volume surfactant. In reverse to number number position, um, 12 to 15 degrees will also help to minimize the risk of reflux. Repeat Lisa procedure, um, use of, if you can avoid this, is a higher dose like poractant alpha 200 milligram per kilo and how do we improve the LISA success as we said two studies have been published use of NIPPV pre and post LISA procedure will help you to keep the baby from getting intubated I think LISA here to stay it's no longer just a fashion so here is a study from by Soumya Gina et al uh, published in pediatric pulmonology from India does it work in low and middle income countries the largest randomized control trial, they had 350 babies. I want to congratulate them. Um, but only 50 babies are less than 28 weeks. Um, birth weight, 1630. Median, 31 weeks. Time to first dose surfactant, about an hour. 
need for mechanical ventilation within 72 hours was significantly lower. In what they called the sure technique, that's basically LISA, 19% uh, versus 40%. Duration of CPAP was also less. BPD rate was also lower. Ne necrotizing enterocolitis stage three or greater was none, as compared to 7%. Length of stay was shorter with um, LISA or sure method that they called it as. And transient bradycardia and desaturation was 11%. I was really surprised that they did not document any desaturations um, because you remember this insured group in their NICU had, uh, did not use uh, any sedation in all the three centers. So that sure was stands for surfactant without with an intubation without an endotracheal intubation or with an intubation using 16 gauge angiocatheter or six French feeding tube, no sedation in both arms. So they really use the same guidelines in both groups. Like one group didn't get sedation versus other group. No medication in both groups and insure was given with a T piece. So they were able to control the pressure and not with bagging. And two neonatologists with experienced neonatologists did the procedure all the time in these centers. And three NICUs, Lucknow, New Delhi and Hyderabad. Again, I want to congratulate them for doing this study in a resource limited country like India. So insure versus LISA, the arguments are we have no standardization either, neither for LISA nor for insure. There are different sedation policy, variable thresholds for pressure and FiO2 to give surfactant. And as I mentioned, insure technique is supposed to be involved rapid administration surfactant and then extubation. So the first study by Gupta et al. from Calcutta, India, uh, showed they didn't use any sedation. They maintained same uh, surfactant dose and thresholds, and they gave early rescue surfactant, and they gave positive pressure only for about 182 seconds. And they used NIPPV mode in both arms, which has been shown to improve pressure transmission when airways partially occluded. I told you adult studies have shown that. Here is the study from Calcutta, Gupta et al. Again, uh, 28 to 34 week gestation. This is the very first study to compare same poly procedures for insure and LISA and on NIPPV in babies, preterm babies, 58 babies, 200 milligram per kilo, 29 babies got LISA method, insure was 29, similar birth weight, time to first dose an hour, need for mechanical ventilation by half, 10% versus 21%, not statistically significant because small number. BPD was also lower, no IVH, and length of stay was much shorter. So they used five French feeding tube with a megal forceps for LISA, no sedation in both arms, and then again, they decreased the duration of positive pressure breaths. So that's about LISA and insure. And now where do we go? So truly non-invasive surfactant treatment using nebulization or atomization is another area of interest. It's a study published uh, using Hirosur called CureNeb study in preterm babies. Um, this was published in Archives of Disease of Children in 2018. This is number of patients intubated, 29 to 31 weeks. And the nebulized group, uh, is not significant, but in bigger babies, 32 to 30, four weeks, 34 weeks, the number of babies needing intubation was only one out of 11 compared to 10 out of 13. So in more mature babies, nebulized surfactant is able to decrease the need for intubation. Here is a study looking at um, a rabbit study. Federico Bianco from Parma, Italy has done a lot of work in animal studies using this NIST technique or nebulization technique using a special e-flow vibrating uh, neo uh, vibrating membrane nebulizer using undiluted kerosene and uh, they use 200 and 400 milligram per kilo both showed an improvement in pao2 decrease in pco2 and compliance improved and uh, uh, using um, 200 milligram per kilo dose there is a phase two clinical trial is underway uh, sample size 288 28 to 32 week gestation with rds is registered in the European uh, Euro DAC. And uh, I guess we need to wait for uh, outcome. 
about uh, nebulized with 400 milligrams of kerosene, but insured 200 milligrams using CPAP in one day only one piglets. So they lavage the lung, created RDS, and they showed that both insured and nebulization with kerosene reduced the need for mechanical ventilation at 72 hours of age, improved lung mechanics, compliance improved, and as well as PF ratio, improved gas exchange here, improved gas exchange. So both insured method and nebulization works equally in this animal model. So if nebulization can work, we can totally avoid intubation. Uh, I think it's an interesting concept, but it needs to be tested in babies. So they looked at atomization, um, learned from Sweden, and Bianco was also one of the investigators. Um, NIST, here the NIST is supraglottic airway device, using the atomization in a piglet model, term piglets. Uh, here is the epiglottis. This is the pharyngeal cannula that was used to deliver um, surfactant. Uh, and they showed that distribution uh, using the uh, radio labeled surfactant with the atomization versus installation uh, by the endotractic were very similar. So lung deposition, they found 40% of the lung surfactant got deposited in the lung. Typically when you intubate give surfactant, about 80% of the surfactant gets deposited. So they were nebulized for a period of about 30 minutes. So again, another major uh, development is a newer synthetic surfactant using peptide analogs for SPB and SPC. We just completed a trial, multicentral trial published in this month in Journal of Pediatrics. And we showed that Kirosur, uh, this uh, new synthetic surfactant works as good as Kirosur in terms of FiO2 needs. SF ratio improvement, were very similar in the two groups. What about in, in Rexure? So here in this study uh, from Italy, Vento et al published, they intubated the babies, placed them on high frequency oscillatory ventilation at a mean airway pressure of eight, 15 Hertz, amplitude of 15, oxygen was guided uh, target saturation. So they show that a lung recruitment maneuver just before surfactant administration improved the efficacy of surfactant treatment in extremely preterm neonates compared with standard insure technique without increasing the risk for adverse neonatal outcome. But they called it as a non-invasive respiratory support strategy. I don't think so. Intubating, putting the baby on oscillator, I don't think it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's going to be practiced. So, this, I guess, my last slide. So, multi center randomized control trial we are planning called the LISPAP study. Hopefully, we'll start in early 2021 using the LISA catheter. This is the catheter with the markings, both the distally, the round soft tip, 25 to 28 to be gestation on nasal non invasive ventilation support, FIO2 0.3 or greater, saturation 88 to 95, sample size 150, 2 to 1, 100 babies to LISA. 50 babies to ensure this trial has been registered with clinicaltrials.gov. So we haven't started recruiting yet. So we talked about the past, present, and future is going to be, you know, four major interventions in preterm babies for RDS management include antenatal corticosteroids, avoiding routine intubation, and stabilizing the babies on nasal CPAP or NIPPV, and then early rescue surfactant treatment and caffeine. Thank you very much for your attention and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Stop sharing. Yeah. Right? Okay. It is always a pleasure to listen to you, Professor Ram. So your talk was so nice uh, that uh, we just did not realize it is almost like uh, now uh, 40, uh, uh, more than one hour and then we are still want to hear more from you. But anyway, now uh, friends, before we move on to the discussion part, there is a slight change. We will take a small commercial break for a short video clip. After four minutes, we'll come back for the discussions. Yes, sir. Briefly, Professor Ola Saksta. Thank you, Professor Ola. I hope you're being well. Thank you, Professor Ola, for being with us. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome back. As one of our moderators, Dr. Karthik Nakesh had to leave earlier due to some unavoidable requirement, I will initiate the discussion before handing over the floor to my co-moderator, Dr. Uma. Uh, uh, Professor Ram, there are few questions related to the length and procedure of the uh, 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 LISA. Uh, like uh, Dr. Rema Nakpal from India has asked, does the length of tube inserted relate to reflex? Dr. Indu Khosla has asked, do we need to move the position of the baby while doing the procedure? So, I think, I think uh, the, you don't have to move the baby. Keep the baby in midline, head and a little bit elevated, 12 to 15 degrees, reverse turn, run, burp. And then use the same thing, uh, you know, uh, lip to tip uh, distance that you use for endotracheal intubation like NRP suggests, at the easiest way, six plus one, the weight of the baby. If you have markings, like the Lisa cat has, you can put in babies less than 28 weeks, 1.5 centimeters, and in babies over 28 weeks, you can insert uh, two centimeters. Thank you. Now, uh, something related to similar, uh, the procedure only, what is the interface for an APPV? Uh, Deepika from UC Davis has asked, uh, and for your 2012 study, what was the interface? Was it RAM cannula? And then again, another similar question about the maintenance of positive pressure during LISA. So what are the interfaces and then your comments on that? And in our center, that's a multi-center trial. So five center study that we published earlier. Um, one, three centers use RAM cannula. 
The other two centers used uh, Inca, Hertz, and Bronx. You can use any binasal interface that you're using in your NICU. Um, so uh, both will, all of them will transmit pressure. You know, recently a paper from uh, uh, by um, from India. Um, uh, oh, I'm blocking his name. Um, Turkey. Uh, Srinivas, they published a paper comparing pressure transmission with face mask and Inca prongs or binasal prongs and ram cannula. They all showed similar. Uh, you have to use a little bit higher pressure with any non invasive interface uh, because of the high resistance. So I would leave that to whatever you are using in your unit is fine. Uh, in terms of um, transmitting the pressure, I told you that adult studies have shown during bronchoscopy, if you keep them on non invasive pressure support, they actually, baby patients tolerate better without desaturations. In baby studies now, one, two, three studies have been published, two from India, one from US, that showed that um, post pre, if you use NIPPV, you get much better response than CPAP. So I would recommend if it's available, you should use. If you don't have it, then just use bubble CPAP or any CPAP that you're used to. When we work in resource limited settings, uh, what is your take on the other uh, tubes that like feeding tube and all other types of catheters? Like uh, how effective will they be in uh, uh, the procedure? No, I, I think you can use a feeding tube. Uh, the problem with feeding tube is, uh, you know, you need to be very well experienced using a megal forceps because it's soft, not easy to direct into the trachea anteriorly. So if you have good experience, you know, if you are in resource limited place, in small level two units or community NICUs or hospitals or peripheral centers, then there, I don't think there'll be people with a lot of experience. That's why uh, an angio cat, which is a little uh, stiffer, uh, it'd be easier uh, to direct the catheter anteriorly with your finger into the trachea. So that's the preference. As I said, like in Canada, they always use nasotracheal intubation. So they're very good with using megal forceps in European countries. They use megal forceps all the time. In the US, I only used for maybe five times megal forceps in my experience, because we always do oral tracheal intubations. Okay. So uh, On that note, may I ask my co moderator, because some of us are using uh, uh, NG tube uh, and without anesthesia, we are doing this procedure. So, like, may I uh, ask uh, Dr. Uma to take over and uh, continue with the same? Thank you, sir. Um, so we have uh, some question on uh, reflex. Uh, so to ask uh, them, like, uh, I think first question has been already uh, asked by Dr. Manoj, length of the tube, is there any relation to the length of the tube and reflex? That is by Dr. Rama Northwal. And Dr. Pati Singh has asked, can we increase the dose of surfactant because there is increased reflex in the procedure and Dr. Mohammed Tosifullah has asked, can we repeat surfactant because there is reflex? If they find the reflex, then should we repeat the surfactant? No, I mean, uh, length of the tube, no, doesn't matter. Length of the tube outside the baby, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes, because, yes, yeah. Length of the tube outside, no. It has a lot of dead space. You need to flush it after you finish the surfactant with air so that any residual surfactant in the tubing gets delivered to the baby. So that's number one. Typically, we use 14 or 15 uh, or 16 uh, millimeter long, uh, like an ET tube length. So we don't centimeter. So we don't have to um, um, worry about the longer tube. If there's a longer tube, there's a lot of surfactant stuck to the wall of the tubing, and you'll have to deliver, push it in. So preferably not use more than 30 centimeters. If you're using a feeding tube, just pre-cut it to 30 centimeters. So that way, you're not wasting a lot of surfactant. In order to reduce the reflux, um, you know, close the mouth, use a lower volume surfactant and give it slowly. If you see a lot of, um, the only way you know that there's a lot of reflux is when you suction, you see a lot of this bubbly stuff in the oropharynx. Well, I don't know how much the baby got. Like in the LMA study, 50% of the surfactant was in the stomach in 18% of the babies. So the only way I would uh, repeat the dose is if I didn't see the response that I was anticipating, improvement in oxygenation, ventilation, and I was able to reduce the FiO2 or mean airway pressure, then I would repeat the dose. And there is no uh, time interval. You could repeat it in two hours or six hours or 12 hours, depending on the baby continues to be sick and the FiO2 is more than still 40 or 
X-ray didn't show any much change. You can, maybe it's not a simple pneumonia, um, RDS, it's probably congenital pneumonia. I would repeat the dose. Thank you, sir. And uh, somewhere kind of related to the technique, um, I think uh, they kind of still wanted to know whether Lisa and Mr. are uh, one and the same. Um, and also they wanted to know a little bit more about uh, nebulized surfactant, what is the dose and what is the duration? Uh, and also, is there any uh, research going on on nanoparticles? Uh, nebulized surfactant, uh, in all the studies have been done, uh, except uh, um, in uh, the QRNAP study, um, uh, is, the, uh, is on animal models. So there is a big uh, uh, phase three studies planned, phase two study, phase three studies planned in babies that I showed you the um, trial registration number uh, in Europe. Um, but I'm not aware of any nebulized studies in babies. So in the, that study, uh, the nebulized in a medium duration was about 48 or 50 minutes. So if you have to nebulize, you have to nebulize approximately for 40 to 50 minutes. And the dose they've tried both 200 and 400 milligram in animal model even 200 milligram uh, nebulization with 40% of them getting into the lung, in the animal lung model. Um, the mass median aerodynamic diameter, which controls how much of it goes into the lung is somewhere between two to four in those studies. But once it gets into the trachea, it picks up water and the diameter of the surfactant molecule size becomes bigger. So until it gets into the airway, even if it gets into the airway, so fact will easily go down uh, into the alveoli. So yeah, as long as you can get into the distal alveol airways, you will be able to deliver more surfactant. I think that's why this special E nebulizer, uh, vibrating membrane nebulizer um, that was patented by a group in Paris uh, appears to be a good one. Is there anything on nanoparticles, sir? No, not that I know of. Um, and there is some questions on catheter relation related questions. Uh, is there any advantage of one catheter over the other? If feeding tube is recommended, what is the size of feeding tube to be inserted? And is there, uh, can we use a guide wire uh, to insert the catheter? So these are some no, of the questions. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't use a guide wire because the, you know, especially in micro preemie, the trachea is so soft. I don't know if any of you have seen the trachea in a micro preemie, it's very easy to perforate. I'm really surprised that we are not perforating uh, many tracheas in these micro preemies, 23 and 24 weeks. It's just like a noodle, like a glass tube, very little cartilage. So I wouldn't recommend using a, a stylet. Um, uh, and then feeding tube, um, four French, five French, six French, any of them could be used. In studies, they've used anywhere from four to six French. The smaller the diameter of the tube, the less chances for reflux. And I also think that is a, like a 1.7 millimeter outer diameter, the angiocat. When you give it like a mini bolus, you're actually causing a spray at the distal end of the tube and that will easily go down rather than big droplets. So that's another reason why Lisa may work better than a big um, bolus of um, uh, uh, surfactant. But if you're using a, a higher, higher viscosity surfactant, then you need is a larger volume. You have a low viscosity surfactant, then you don't need a huge volume. And that's the advantage of uh, coractant alpha, for example. There are, there are some questions related where we should uh, uh, do LISA. Is it in the delivery room? Where should we start? No, um, don't bother about giving surfactant in the delivery room. Our goal in the delivery room is to stabilization, stabilization, get a smooth transition. Yeah. Prophylactic surfactant is no longer recommended. Okay, unless the baby got intubated as part of resuscitation, then you can give surfactant. Again, you can do it in the NICU. There's no reason. Uh, in a NICU is a much well controlled um, situation rather than the delivery room. I would not recommend. I don't take surfactant to the delivery room in my unit. Even if the 23 weeker mom didn't get any steroids and the likelihood baby is going to get intubated, I'm going to intubate the baby, stabilize the baby, make sure you're not giving too much oxygen or make sure you are giving CPAP appropriately. So focus on resuscitation, avoid hypothermia, things that we can easily control in the delivery room. Bring the baby to the ICU. You have one to two hours to give surfactant, early rescue surfactant. Don't wait for six or seven hours. I was looking at some questions, you know, uh, if the baby is on 40% oxygen, 
Why do you want to give surfactant? I just showed you the study. Even in LMA study, the better response was seen in babies between 30 to 35. And three retrospective studies that showed 0.03 area under the curve was 0.7 or 0.8 to predict CPAP failure. If you go to use a neck drug that's expensive, that requires skill, use it early rather than wait. Yeah, occasionally some babies will get better without surfactant, but that is not, uh, should be the general approach. Dr. Veronica has uh, asked, please, with all the advantage of surfactant over the years, what will it have more advocacy to governments, big pharma, to shift the dialogue for low cost, effective sur surfactant for LMIC? to reduce uh, neonatal mortality and morbidity. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a baby doctor, just like all of you practicing neonatologists. I don't have no control over the government regulations and the pharma industry, right? So it's a good question. Um, you need to make it available. Um, so, you know, maybe if the synthetic pattern comes in, um, uh, it may be available because um, it's easy to transport and uh, uh, it may be uh, yeah, beneficial even in ARDS patients, like acute RDS patients. So wherever, the, for example, meconium aspiration or surfactant activation conditions. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I have no idea. Yes, sir. sir uh, we have a few more questions on surfactant. Like, uh, yeah. Um, so till what day of life can we use uh, surfactant and whether like previously there has been a myth that we should not shake surfactant is it true you should not shake, shake the, surfactant? the surfactant no you gently you know do it warm the surfactant you don't want to create a lot of bubbles so we shouldn't do that that's in the package insert in terms of how old the baby could be before the baby gets surfactant there's no age limit you know baby got let's say rds you give surfactant baby got better you're able to wean or day seven, day 10, what we call as an early phase or exudative phase of BPD, the lungs are leakier, you know, you're not fixed, you're not fixed the anatomical problem of the canalicular lung, right? It's continuing to leak. So in those babies, evolving BPD babies, or what we some people call post-surfactant slump, they, they act like they didn't get any surfactant. Their actually looks like on day one or yes. In those babies, we used to give steroids, now, because of all the problems with the postnatal steroid use, you want to minimize, you could give surfactant in those babies and improve the lung compliance, lung function, and try to extubate the baby. Yeah, there's no postnatal age limit for giving surfactant. People have used even a month old baby that got surfactant in the beginning and they've given surfactant again and showed improvement in lung compliance and ventilatory efficiency index. Pandit from Canada and a couple of uh, studies from the US uh, have shown that. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, there is uh, one question regarding uh, failure of LISA. If LISA fails, the next procedure, should it be insured? No, mm, next procedure should be probably, you know, either the baby has a complicated RDS and uh, I don't know whether you gave a higher dose of uh, surfactant or not. Let's say you used 100 milligrams of surfactant, 135 milligrams of surfactant dosing, then you need to give up the second dose and it could be given by LISA again. There's no, you know, all the studies have shown that, um, except for reflux, uh, uh, studies are in favor of LISA compared to insure. So I would, uh, I would repeat the same procedure. Uh, doing insure um, in a baby that hasn't responded well to surfactant, that means baby's compliance is poor, still has lung disease, and if you give positive pressure, you're going to come, you're going to cause injury. One suggestion somebody recommended, like Daniela De Luca says. Maybe you should have a volume controlled ventilator when you're giving surfactant so you can accurately titrate the tidal volume, four or five ml per kilo. This volume trauma that causes not the barrel trauma, right? So that can be done, but that requires ANSI ventilators and it's expensive. So I like to do things as cheap as possible, as safe as possible. Thank you, sir. So there are some questions regarding uh, the maintenance of pressure. So how to maintain the positive pressure? And the second question is, uh, how, when should we consider NIPPV? Pardon? When should we consider NIPPV instead of uh, CPAP? After okay, the so you are talking to a guy who uses NIPPV as the primary mode from the delivery room. In any baby with respiratory failure, 
or respiratory distress, I start with NIPPV in the delivery room using the teepees on my finger. Baby doesn't need it, I have it on CPAP. I bring the baby to the ICU, put the baby on the NIPPV, and then see what that baby does. The baby is doing well, and if I would be down to 25% or 21%, then I switch the baby to CPAP. So if you're using CPAP as your primary mode, when should you switch the baby to NIPPV? I think you, know, you can use the same criteria people use for intubation criteria. For example, respiratory acidosis, in spite of being on nasal CPAP, CPAP pressure is eight or even 10, some people use, and the FIO is still 50, 60%, then you should start using the NIPPV. But I would strongly recommend if you can do NIPPV, you have much better benefits, even with Lisa, I showed you three studies. I think there are many um, systematic reviews published, Ferguson and Lex Doyle et al. from Canada, uh, from Australia, and Lemery from Canada. They looked at um, early rescue, early NIPPV versus nasal CPAP, 10 randomized controlled trials, over 1,000 plus babies. They showed that early NIPPV is superior to nasal CPAP. This is their own conclusion. So I think if we can do NIPPV, the only problem is you need a ventilator. You can buy any cheap ventilator, synchronized or non-synchronized. Synchronized NIPV is good. If you don't have it, don't get upset. It's still better than CPAP or um, CPAP in terms of decreasing the failures. So I would use NIPV if you have it. If you don't have it, CPAP, and then the indication for the CPAP failure and starting NIPV would be respiratory acidosis, higher FiO2, in spite of optimizing my CPAP pressure, you know, maybe seven or eight or 10 in some cases. Thank you, sir. I, mm -hmm. Do you have any experience on use of NARS on LISA? Uh, during the I don't. Visit? No, I haven't done that. We have the NEARS. Uh, we are just starting to use NEARS in our uh, babies. Um, I'm not, um, there are studies looking at LISA and INSHU and cerebral blood flow using NEARS. Uh, some studies showed that cerebral blood flow is decreased with LISA. Some studies show no difference between these two modes. I think it's a good, uh, um, good tool to monitor the baby during LISA or during INSHU. Again, a lot depends on are the babies well sedated or not? Uh, is the baby hemodynamically stable? Things that are alter the cerebral blood flow has to be taken into account. Obviously, if you block the ET tube uh, and a trachea with the large volumes of fragment or a bolus, you're going to cause hypercarbia transiently, which will increase cerebral blood flow, increase the risk for IVH. So you have to be very, very careful when you're doing these interventions, especially in micro -freeze. You know, our goal is to help the babies, right? And you don't want to cause any damage in the process of uh, treatment. And that's one of the reasons why people, I think Karthik was asking me yesterday, why can't we use high flow nasal cannula after giving surfactant in big babies? I said, 28 weeks are greater. I mean, why would you use a technique that you have zero idea about how much pressure is being delivered? Would you use that in any, any, any situation if it is your own patient? baby or a family baby? I say, no, just get a bubble CPAP. At least you know what the pressure is. Why, why would you want to do that? It's not cheap, nasal high flow nasal cannula, uh, if you want the system. So just get a bubble CPAP, you know, get a bottle of water, some vinegar, boom, you have bubble CPAP. So at least you know how much pressure you're, you're limiting to, not necessarily how much you're delivering, you're limiting to maximum pressure. That's what I would recommend. Thank you, sir. Um, there are some two questions on sedation. Why should we sedate? Um, the second thing is, is it mandatory to use uh, fentanyl and atropine during the procedure? No, I, okay. So uh, atropine, I think, is a lot of people recommending atropine because of um, avoiding bradycardia and desaturations, right? Number one, because that's going to delay your procedure. Baby's heart rate goes down. As soon as you put a laryngoscope, what are you going to do? Take the tube out, allow the baby to recover, right? But if you give atropine, you can minimize that. It's all vaguely mediated, number one. Number two, studies have shown that, especially in the Netherlands to the QI, quality improvement report said that if you sedate the baby, um, your chances of um, LISA is much higher, success rate. And three, AAP, Committee of the Fetus and Newborn, also recommends in elective intubations, the baby should be given sedation. They start with fentanyl, atropine, yes or no, fentanyl, 
and go down. Uh, so I think uh, most people would say awake incubation is, is not a good idea. Uh, adults don't. I mean, there are a lot of reports on adults being intubated without sedation. I'm talking about 30 years ago, and they all described how bad they felt. So I don't, if you can, uh, one, to improve the success, two, um, to follow the guidelines. And um, that's those are the uh, two things uh, I would sedate the baby. Again, fentanyl, morphine takes a long time. You know, peak effect is 10 to 15 minutes. Fentanyl, peak effect is one to three minutes. That's the reason why you are doing a procedure and getting out. So you don't want to wait until the morphine effect, peak effect takes off. That's why we use uh, the uh, committee of the fetus and newborn also recommends uh, fentanyl as your first choice. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, in our unit, by and large, do not use sedation for mis mis just the most common procedure which we use, and we use a uh, five French catheter without sedation, direct laryngoscopy. The only challenge which we face is the learning curve. When a new resident is joining, we make them watch the video, and uh, we have some simulation session for them, and uh, we make them observe the procedure before they kind of practice. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you are, if you are able to successfully do it and you look at your success rate with uh, Lisa without sedation, um, you know, I, I would at least say sucrose, so, you know, babies do feel the pain. You know, for years we said our oh, babies don't feel the pain, but they do, uh, you know, at least sucrose in the tip of the tongue keeps the baby comfortable or colostrum if the baby, if there is colostrum available within an hour or so, you could do that. That's pretty safe and very good. And we do that in all babies nowadays. I'm sure all of you are doing that. So I would, I would still give analgesia. I don't think, uh, you know, putting a laryngosolp into your mouth is a comfortable uh, procedure. So, and we know newborn babies feel pain and discomfort. That's the reason I would still, um, uh, at least we don't want to use uh, opioids, just use uh, breast milk or, or um, okay. uh, sucrose, yeah. There is uh, one more question on complications. Um, so like finding surfactant in the stomach, cough, choking, laryngoscope, all seem unpredictable. Is there a way to prevent them? No, not really. I mean, you're putting a liquid through a tube, it's going to get stuck. Uh, and you have a least um, a resistance pathway, which is esophagus, or I call Grand Canyon. So some surfactant will go down into the stomach from the oropharynx. So the only thing we can do is maintain the positive pressure during surfactant administration and use small volume and do it slowly. There's no reason that you have to push it in within 12, 15 seconds or 20 seconds. Just slow down. Um, you take one or three minutes, as I said, some people are taking five minutes. Yeah, especially if you give it as a mini bolus, keeping the head end of the baby up, mini bolus comes out like a spray and very likely it'll go forward rather than come back up through the trachea. That's what I do. Thank you, sir. There are like two questions on sedation. Uh, can we use ketamine for sedation and can we use metazolam instead of fentanyl? Um, you know, the metazolam is, uh, is not an opioid, right? I mean, it's that's not going to, um, uh, it's, it's only a sedative, right? Not an analgesic. We wanted an analgesic and sedative. Uh, and uh, there are studies that uh, Medasolam or Versed use in preterm babies. I think Anand published uh, uh, many studies on neopain trials uh, and showed that it's neurotoxic. And ketamine has been shown to be neuro, causes apnea. It's one thing. That's why we don't use ketamine. But there are centers that use ketamine a lot. Uh, we only use, as I said, atropine plus sucrose or atropine plus fentanyl in bigger babies to try to fight it. What is the maximum NAPPV to use before considering failing of NAPPV? Is it by 30 centimeters of PIP um, in uh, babies in the first two weeks of age? The baby they established BPD, we have used 35 to 38 over 10, and still we are not able to maintain gases, then we will integrate the baby. Yeah. In, in about 15% of the babies in our hands fail NAPPV and get into bed. So we are able to manage the majority of our babies unless they got intubated in the DR, you know, severe RDS, 23 weaker or 24 weaker, and uh, ended up on the oscillator. Uh, then, uh, you know, 
takes a while for us to extubate them to an IPPV. But if you start with an IPPV, and it'll fail. No, no mode is going to work 100% of the time. In our hands, our failure rate is 50% across up to 30 weeks. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, any data on effectiveness of LISA in relation to the type of interface for CPAP? Any, what are the question? Any type data of interface? on the effectiveness of LISA in relation to the type of interface for CPAP? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, there are no studies. I mean, people have used whatever was the interface they were using in, a, in their own units, right? LISA studies, um, all the studies, they do not recommend or demand that you should use one type of nasal interface. Whatever you are using, and then it's the same for LISA and Insure, I'm, I'm assuming. And that's why none of these studies, they changed. Um, uh, again, a lot of these studies came out of Europe, and their nasal interface is either a mask or um, by nasal prong. Like you saw in the um, Catherine Klebermas uh, demonstration video, they used the mask uh, at the time of surfactant administration. So you can use nasal mask or you can use by nasal prongs. You know, in our case, as I said, we use the cannula. Uh, there are no studies that I know of comparing the different nasal interfaces during LISA and pressure transmission. Uh, I'm not aware of any studies. Thank you, sir. Um, so one has asked about, like, uh, recently, Vigon has introduced SurfCat, which is uh, slightly better and different to Lisa Catheter. What is your experience? Could you share, sir? Uh, I mean, uh, I've seen the video on their website, and I've not seen any studies uh, using, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice one. It has markings on it. You can bend it at the tip. It has a black mark at the tip, so you know, if you see the black line, you are still above the distance. Uh, it's a nice catheter, but um, I don't. Uh, I have no experience. I I, wish, I think it should work, just like Lisa catheter and angio catheter. It's, Thank you, uh, sir. The only thing, only thing I can think of, the tip is not rounded. That's the only thing. Uh, just like an angio catheter tip is not a rounded tip. Other than that, it should work. Thank you, sir. Um, Doctor Oday Kumaran has asked, what is the advantage of caffeine before Lisa? What are the advantage of? Using usage of caffeine. Oh, caffeine. Uh, you know, in when, when you try to intubate the baby or even you sedate the baby, they're going to become apneic, right? So that's the reason you want to improve the respiratory drive of the baby by giving caffeine. So again, it's out of practice. People are starting to do that. The only study, a small study by from Netherlands, they used caffeine in the delivery room and then they measured um, tidal volume, spontaneous breathing. The percentage of spontaneous side breaths, they call side breaths, was much higher in babies that were given caffeine compared to the control babies. Okay, so we know caffeine augments the respiratory drive. Caffeine increased the depth of respiration. Caffeine increased the spontaneous tidal volume compared to no caffeine. So those are the reasons why people are recommending to avoid apnea, shallow respirations, either due to sedation or during the procedure, they recommend you could give caffeine before. Are there any studies done, random studies? No, just practice. People started to use caffeine earlier and earlier. I don't use it in the delivery room, but in Vienna, they often use it in the DR. And Netherlands through uses in the delivery room. We use it in the NICU. So when you are getting ready, babies here, now on NIPPV, now we decide to give Lisa. We have plenty of time, so I say, okay, give, please go ahead and give uh, uh, caffeine. And then we start the um, atropine and either fentanyl or sucrose, depending on my attending. Thank you so much, sir. We have come to an end of the session and okay. it was really ex excellent and we were really overwhelmed by the knowledge gained today. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and moderating and Manoj again for extending an invitation. I feel privileged to be in the same group as Dr. Ola Sakstar, Professor Ola Sakstar, or um, Satyan, who gave the talks before. Uh, it's a delight. Thank you. Sir, kindly unmute, sir. Manoj, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We are, I mean, actually, we are feeling sorry that uh, we are, I mean, uh, taken much more time than we at all will take. And the discussion, there are still more questions coming in, but then uh, it's so kind of you to stay so long. 
at the same time let me uh, uh, take the liberty of asking professor ola uh, do you want to speak few words before we wind up thank you so much for coming sir well thank you uh, it's always a, a pleasure to listen to ram's lecture uh, and also this time thank you very much ram uh, i think this was i learned a lot it was very very good thank you and uh, it's a privilege to take part in these uh, seminars and uh, you have done a great job thank you sir thank you uh, thank you professor ram so now uh, friends uh, as we keep saying all good things have to come to end we hate to break it up but then we need to stop uh, please do join us again uh, for uh, uh, a talk on uh, hfo vg the the recent advances in high frequency oscillation by professor sandish luna from spain that will be on 14th of october before that uh, those of you who are interested in research we have a trainees research paper competition this sunday you are free to log in the details are i have been already circulated that's at a different time that is 10 am indian time so uh, again um, uh, our heartfelt thanks to professor ram for such a wonderful uh, lecture uh, we hope to see you uh, professor all all of you next year god willing uh, for uh, the iap neocon in person if at all it happens uh, so we welcome you in advance for that uh, to kerala for that on that note uh, may i no request uh, uh, dr pawan the secretary of nnf uh, trishu to propose official vote of thanks and wind up the session thank you thank you everybody dr pawan okay fine so uh, friends i think uh, uh, the, the we don't need to be uh, so formal about the whole thing so thank you all we are truly humbled to have response from i mean uh, the representation from um, uh, almost 60 uh, countries so the it is a overwhelming we are truly humbled by this and then uh, thank you so much please do attend and share your experience it's, it's a nice uh, experience learning platform for us thank you so much thank you very much Thank you sir. Thank you so much sir. Okay, be safe. Bye sir.